uh, in, in condensed matter physics, people have also known this. So I'm, I'm picking out an example from, from some of the recent Simons benchmarks where they show that AFQMC, so this is the, the uh, cross here, uh, is well within the accuracy of a variety of other many body methods for describing the Hubbard model, which is a historically different, uh, difficult model to describe. So we know that AFQMC can be accurate. Uh, people have, have made it sort of the benchmark method for a lot of different systems for, for energies. Um, but there are a couple of issues with, with QMC, you know, some, some of which are good, some of which are, are bad. Uh, so QMC is inherently stochastic, which we celebrate for bringing down our scaling. Um, but what that also means is that it has large statistical error bars uh, and you have to simulate to long times to, to, to bring down those, those error bars. Uh, it also has issues calculating a variety of different forces. Uh, so if you want to obtain the forces, you, you have to take great gradients of the energy. Uh, and as many of you know, for 20 or 30 years now, it's been challenging to think about how you compute those forces accurately and without bias. Uh, needless to say, there are probably other people who'll talk about that, th those issues uh, later this week. Um, QMC is also not readily amenable to things like, like K-point sampling, um, which means that we typically have to model things uh, in larger and larger supercells if we want to think about how do we extrapolate to the thermodynamic limit. Uh, and so this poses challenges if we think about some systems that, that chemists, so I'm, I'm a chemist, and you talk to people in my department, and they say, why aren't you working on catalysis about six times a day? Um, you know, chemists want to look at different types of catalytic systems. If we wanted to model a system like this, uh, so this example is CO uh, on platinum 111. Uh, in this system, it's, it's been a long standing challenge for density functional theory to be able to predict whether the CO binds at the top site or the FCC site. So historically, if you just pop in any density functional, it would predict the FCC site. But in, in fact, it's the less coordinated site that the CO binds to. Uh, and so for years, DFT got this wrong. And so you might say, why don't we use Quantum Monte Carlo uh, to get this? And, and, and some people have, you know, in my group, we've, we've also looked at this problem. Um, but if you actually want to get this right, if you really want to do catalysis, uh, you have to be able to get forces. You, you have to be able to move these atoms across a surface. Uh, and you, you also have to do this with, with very, very high accuracy and be able to extrapolate to, to the thermodynamic limit. So if you want to look at these systems, which are in, in some sense a, a chemist stream, um, we need to add a little bit more functionality to what, what QMC can do. Uh, and there are a number of approaches for doing this, but maybe uh, what I'm trying to suggest is that there's plenty of room uh, for including ML. Yeah, David. I um, sort of wanted to argue with you your last point there sure. about whether QMC uh, has problems with the K-point integration. Because I always argue that it's better than DFT in that respect, because you can do the K-port sampling just as another random thing, whereas DFT, it scales with the number of K-points, while QMC, it, it's independent of the number of K-points sure, with first sure. approximation. Sure, sure. I, I, I think that's a, a fair thing to say. I, I mean, I, I guess what I, I'm typically thinking about is, is we have some sort of supercell and we still have to do an extrapolation. So if you're talking about the one body effects, right, we can do twist averaging. But then if we're talking about two body interactions, we still have to do some sort of finite size extrapolation. Yeah, the exact method has that same problem. The, yes, yes. So you're just saying, well, if you have an exact method, you, sure. you have to do some. Yes. You have to have a theory of finite size scaling. That, that's absolutely right. Yes. Uh, so, you know, one body is taken care of, two body is harder if you want to do a many body method. Uh, and we, we have to understand how to extrapolate to uh, those many body methods. Uh, and, you know, part of, part of the issue here is that QMC is much more expensive. And so doing that extrapolation is, is also more challenging. Yeah, the more expensive part, I think we can agree on. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. All right. Um, so, you know, part of the motivation for, for looking at machine learning uh, is, is some of the work that's recently come out. Uh, so we, we know that people have been able to, to learn uh, phase transitions and, and also look at a, a variety of, of corrections, so doing different types of delta machine learning uh, in order to correct energies. And so these sort of serve as, as fodder for thinking about, you know, can we take 
the computational cost of QMC, maintain its accuracy, or perhaps even improve it, uh, while bringing the cost down using using machine learning. And so, you know, we, we kind of joke around. Maybe this is like the Iron Man uh, situation. Uh, we're, we're giving Iron Man some extra technology to, to make him even more powerful than he was before. So we'd be taking QMC, uh, using machine learning to, to actually make it more powerful. All right. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, our, our two vignettes, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll just say that the people involved with this work, uh, so the, the first person who worked on uh, the first part of this talk is Edgar Landinas Borda. He's now with, with Claudia in, in, in Twente. Uh, and then a couple of my uh, excellent graduate students, Kong Kong Huang uh, and Gopal Iyer, both, both in chemistry, worked on the, the second parts of this. All right, uh, so let's, let's talk about extrapolation to the thermodynamic limit. Uh, and here I just show two uh, examples. Uh, so as, as our dialogues, my dialogue with David just clarified, uh, you know, QMC methods are, are many body methods uh, and you can do K point sampling. Uh, I should probably reword this, but, but you still need to do finite size uh, extrapolation in order to get uh, correct for finite size effects. Uh, and so what that means is that you're gonna have to take these, these cells uh, and, and you're going to have to extend them in multiple directions, uh, calculate their energies, uh, and then extrapolate those energies down. So, so here's that CO on PT system. Uh, and what we have to do is we have to simulate larger and larger systems and then extrapolate to the thermodynamic limit uh, to, to, to get this, this blue uh, final extrapolated value, in this case for, for the binding energy is what I'm showing. But can we bring this cost down uh, using extrapolations? Yeah. Can you explain a little bit of this uh, n to the minus uh, phi for scaling? Oh, okay. Uh, so this was just for this specific system. Uh, so, so this was binding to, to a 2D surface. Uh, so this has been worked out. I think actually Matthew has done most of that scaling work. Which must be me. <laughs> Whoever has Zoom running, please turn it off. Otherwise, very soon we'll have feedback. Okay. Is there an analytic origin of this scaling? Yeah, yeah. So, so this scaling was uh, first, I, I guess, uh, Drummond and Meads worked this out. Uh, I'm remembering well, the, into the five fourths. Into the the negative five fourths. Yeah, that comes to the. I can explain it to you, but it's uh, it has to do with two dimensional plasmons and how SFK, you know, goes, SFK goes to three halves and you work through it. That's what you get. If you want to make a straight line, you plot it, the energy versus into the five force. I, I can refer you to the, the paper. So we didn't derive this our, ourselves. Uh, so this is a well-known result in the literature. Um, okay. Uh, so what do we wanted to do is, is to see if we can connect, uh, correct finite size uh, effects uh, using a very simple model. Uh, so we, we started with uh, hydrogen chains. And so these are just linear hydrogen chains. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, hydrogen chains, uh, their physics is basically governed uh, by their spacing. So this RHH is, is the distance between two H uh, atoms. Uh, and as you stretch these chains, their behavior changes from being that of a metal to being that of an insulator. Uh, and as you can imagine, as you, you stretch them, right, the electrons become further and further apart. Uh, and, and so it's harder for them to hop from site to site. Uh, and so that hopping term goes down, uh, but, but the repulsive term sort of stays relatively constant. Uh, so that, that creates an, an insulator. Um, they, well, as you stretch these, uh, the, this distance will reach a minimum, as, as you might expect, just for a hydrogen dimer. Uh, and that minimum is, is somewhere around uh, 1.74. Uh, and so you can take a look at the properties of this. And this was done by the, the Simons collaboration and, and, and Shiwei. Uh, you, you can see this metal uh, insulator transition using the polarization. We can also see ferromagnetic to antiferromagnetic behavior as well. Um, I should note this chain is, is relatively simple in the sense that uh, you don't have to worry about pseudopotentials, um, but, but also in, in terms, and I'll, I'll place this as a caveat for the, the work that I'm showing here, uh, you can think about its physics as being governed by this RHH, um, and also if you want to extrapolate the thermodynamic limit, the, the, the number of hydrogens that are involved in this chain. So in, in some sense, this is a much easier case than, than many other systems, so I'll, I'll just preface with that. So in, in order to try to come up with these extrapolations, uh, we, we first generated a database of AFQMC and, and, and couple cluster energies, uh, about 250 points for each chain, 
uh, between one and, and 3.654. Uh, and we generated this for, for 10 to 30 atom chains. Uh, so what we want to do is extrapolate to the thermodynamic limit. So very, very long chains. Uh, but we started with a database of 10 to 30 atom chains, which are much smaller chains. Uh, and then we would use longer chains for benchmarking. So we, we chose couple cluster uh, so that we could relatively quickly be able to, to obtain uh, longer 200 atom or so chains. Uh, what we then did is, is we, we trained a model that was based on, on SOAP uh, descriptors. So, so we described our chains uh, using the smooth overlap of uh, atomic position descriptors. Uh, and what these basically are is you, you can imagine that you have a, a density. So you have an electron density uh, around each atom. Uh, and then you can take the overlap of that density to obtain these coefficients, so these Cs, uh, describe the overlap of that density uh, with uh, <laughs> spherical harmonics, uh, and, and also radial uh, functions. Uh, so that's what these NLMs are. Uh, and so depending upon the density's overlap, uh, you'll, you'll get these coefficients. Um, and that produces uh, essentially a feature which, which we call the power spectrum. Um, you can put these power spectra uh, into a kernel. Uh, and what we're, we're using here uh, are radial uh, basis function kernels. Uh, and once you, you place these power spectra into these, these kernels, you can then learn how to weight these different kernels to pr produce the overall energy. Um, so these smooth overlap of atomic position descriptors are, are generally used for much more complicated uh, molecular and atomic systems. Yeah. Just a quick question. Um, for your atomic local environment, you said the electron density. Is it the electron density or the atomic density around each atom? Uh, so I just want to clarify. Sure, sure. Um, well, it's a little bit of both. So, so it's where the atoms are, it's a function of R, but then they also have electrons around them. Uh, so, so we are getting that electronic information because that's the information that we have. So, so sorry, can I add in that little R in that equation too mm -hmm. is, is what, what's it labeling? Sure, sure. So the R is the position uh, of, uh, so some position in space uh, and this is, so you have your electronic system. Uh, you're describing that system as a function of space. And you're saying at this position R, uh, what is this coefficient? Uh, so this coefficient, this, this C, is calculating the, the overlap at, at this position uh, of the electron, the, the density, uh, and then also the, the spherical harmonics uh, that, that you can use to, to obtain these coefficients. So overlaps don't usually depend on position. They're usually just numbers. That's what's confusing me. Uh, yeah, so, so this, this is a number. We're evaluating this as, as a function of position. Right, so at each position, we're, we're getting a, a P here. So you're taking overlap over all those different positions. Uh, and then we're getting this, this power spectrum. Um, once we have that power spectrum, we can plug it into the, the kernel. Uh, and then it, this kernel, these kernels can be added up and, and weighted appropriately to get the total energy. All right, uh, so we can do that and we can predict the different energies. Uh, and this is, this is one example uh, using our, our couple cluster. So a couple things to, to point out here. So we're, we're plotting this as a function of bond length. And, and what we're plotting is the difference between uh, our prediction, so EGPR, uh, and the energies that you would expect from, from couple cluster uh, as a function of this bond length. Uh, and what we see uh, is that obviously for the, the smaller systems, these are the systems on which we're actually training. Uh, we, we do predict things very, very closely. Uh, that, that's sort of expected. As you go to larger systems for which we don't have, we don't have these in our training set, we get much larger errors uh, overall. Um, but I should still point out, so these green lines here uh, are basically one millihartree errors, uh, and we're still well within the, these two different error bars. So, so this is uh, within millihartree accuracy. We can then do the same thing uh, using AFQMC. And what, what's interesting is, is in general, we found the AFQMC to be much smoother. Uh, you know, that's because we think this, this ends up being more accurate. Uh, some of the points, so there, there are probably a few points in, the, in these training sets that probably fell to local minima, which, which creates some, some confusion here. Um, but the AFQMC is smoother, uh, still very similar trends, right? So the, the larger chains, as you might expect, uh, produce larger errors overall. So once we're, we're able to benchmark that, say, you know, how accurate are we? How inaccurate are we? Uh, then we can try to do our, our, our extrapolations. Uh, so here we're plotting energy uh, as a function of inverse N. 
Uh, and this is for different bond lengths. Um, what I'm showing are the AFQMC answers. Uh, I'm showing a, a very simple extrapolation. Uh, our GPR results are the squares. Uh, and then this is a, a reference thermodynamic limit uh, for, from some of the Simons benchmarks. Um, what we see is that at shorter bond lengths, our, our predictions are, are, are relatively easy. So all these methods line up. Um, as we get closer to the bond minimum, uh, we, we do see that there, there is some variation. Uh, now, what's nice uh, about the GPR method is that it does inherently come with, with error bars on it. Uh, and so we can see the envelope of, of the prediction overall. Uh, and we can see that there's, there's, there are small differences here, but, but still reasonably accurate. Um, this suggests that the method is, is, is working. Uh, I'll, I'll get into some caveats in, in a little bit. Couple more things that we can do. Uh, we can also ask the question, if we actually have data for, for these very large chains, uh, how well, are, you know, how close are we to the thermodynamic limit? Uh, so these triangles are in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, N equals 200 is, is just for sizes of, of 200. Uh, and you can see that we're close, uh, certainly at larger bond lengths, but there still needs to be some convergence at, at, at smaller bond lengths overall. Um, so it's close to converge, but, but not necessarily fully converged at n equals 200. Uh, and, and just lastly, I'll note uh, one other thing that we can compare with is, is the subtraction trick, which is commonly used, I think it mostly was, was from the DMRG liter literature. Uh, in this trick, what you do is you take two system sizes uh, and you basically solve for what is the, the energy uh, per atom that's involved. Uh, and we, we can compare to that. Uh, so we, we can take our GPR, compare to the subtraction trick. And we, we again, see that we're, we're all within millihartries of each other. So we are able to, to do these extrapolations. We are able to, to go to the thermodynamic limit uh, at, at relatively reduced cost, only looking at very small chains. We're not looking at super, super long chains. Uh, we're just looking at things of 10 to 30 atoms. Um, what I will say, however, about this, and, and this is where I'm saying some of this is still preliminary, is that th this is a hydrogen system, right? So I'm not saying this is a, an incredibly difficult sophisticated system. Uh, as I mentioned before, what you're really looking at is, is, is this number of atoms and the spacing between them. So it should not be that hard to, to extrapolate at the end of the day. Um, but what we really hope to do with this and what we're working on now is, is much harder systems, uh, systems that, that don't have uh, you know, regular Rs uh, and that also for which we don't necessarily have uh, easy to obtain expressions for, for the extrapolation. And that would be the real power of, of doing this, uh, is, is if we can actually extrapolate for, for situations uh, where you have mixed interfaces where it might be difficult to say what your extrapolation would truly be. Okay, uh, I'll go to a second video. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, a question on the errors. Sure. Uh, I mean, probably it's not, do you see magic numbers in the uh, five um, for example, mm -hmm. you're inside, just inside the metal. Yep. The mechanism is pretty tricky. So you get magnetic things that, you know, uh, if you have a site of 20, yep. uh, one electron that pops up. So 20, 40 would be magic numbers, something like that. Right, so, right. It's a good question. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a good question. So we, we didn't see any features. So, so we did some looking at this. We didn't see features of magnetic order, but we also weren't trying to see those, those filling effects. So, um, you know, we, we were working at, you know, multiples of, of, of 20 anyway. So we wouldn't necessarily see it. So we, we didn't try to trick the system into to seeing those things, but I, I'm sure if we look closely, we probably- It would. seems sensible that the larger are the size effect is smaller. Yes. And then as you just cross the Point that seems to pick up that yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's right. Um, so I, I think that's a fair point. You know, maybe we should go into these data sets and, and, and look quite, quite closely at exactly what we're, we're training on in this region. And, and so it's very possible that that could simplify things. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, so the, the second vignette I wanted to talk about today uh, was doing ab initio molecular dynamics using, using quantum Monte Carlo methods. Uh, so as, as many of you are very familiar with in, in many situations, just like the heterogeneous catalysis situation I was talking about before, we're very much interested in, in, in trying to understand the, the dynamics of particles at, at surfaces. This is just from a, a different example uh, in, in my group where we're trying to understand, let's say methane on, on gold surface dynamics. 
We're also typically interested in, in relaxing molecules. Uh, so doing geometry optimizations and, and, and those also uh, require some amount of, of, of forces. Uh, but, but sometimes obtaining these forces within QMC can, can be a costly challenge. Uh, I, I know that there have been recent advances in, in the past several years, really, that, that are at least trying to push the cost of these things down, but I would still say they, they remain something uh, of a challenge. Uh, and so if we wanted to, let's say, obtain dynamics uh, to get around some of those costs uh, while we're, we're waiting for even further advances, um, one tip that we can take is, is from uh, some of the engineering literature. So uh, recently, many engineers have gotten interested in how do you actually make force fields uh, that allow you to bring down the cost of ab initio molecular dynamics. Uh, so, so here's an example where you might want to do that. Uh, so in, in this case, I'm, I'm showing uh, platinum, just a platinum 111 system. Uh, and over a long period of time, uh, a, a vacancy will form in this system. So you have these, these green atoms that are highlighted. And at some point, uh, one of these green atoms will, will exit the surface. Uh, and you can trace that out using molecular dynamics. At some point, this vacancy will, will form. And you might want to predict that. You might want to predict that quickly, uh, but with the accuracy of an electronic structure method. Uh, and so what engineers have been doing is, is coming up with force fields that allow you to very, very quickly replace ab initio molecular dynamics with DFT uh, with a, a, a machine learned force field that would allow you to predict the same dynamics. So here ensemble basically means a machine learning technique. Uh, and what they've been using to, to do that, uh, at least in these situations, is, is Baylor Paranello neural networks. Uh, so the basic idea here is you, you feed in your, your atomic coordinates uh, and then you, you symmetrize them. So you produce some, some features, G, uh, that, that now account for rotational and translational symmetries. Uh, and once you have these features, uh, you then apply neural networks that are going to learn the energies of, of the atoms in your system. And then you add up these energies uh, and you obtain your overall energy. It's important for us is if we want to obtain forces, uh, once you learn these energies, you can differentiate uh, the, these neural networks. So you, you can just take the derivative uh, with respect to uh, your, your, your position uh, and then uh, do that uh, with respect to your descriptors as well. Um, and, and that will basically give you your forces. Uh, and so people, yeah, David. Well, maybe you're gonna say this, but sure. if you just use the energy and not the forces, you have much reduced the amount of data that you absolutely need. absolutely david uh that that's the fundamental issue here so uh when when people typically do this they do this with forces and with energies and and i'll show you the differences uh so without forces obviously leads to, to much higher error bars um so I'll, I'll show you that in a second um but what i would suggest is is probably the the best route to go is actually do a hybrid where you're actively learning forces and then incorporating the force information uh, in order to, to sort of balance costs. Uh, so, you know, you pick up the forces where you have the most uncertainty <laughs> and then you help those to, to learn the rest. Um, so you're absolutely right. All right. Uh, so what we can do is, is we can do this to, to try to predict QMC level forces. Uh, and I, I show this for a few simple systems. Uh, carbon dimer, just a simple stretch. Uh, I know a lot of people have been working on, on dimers for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, water uh, to, to show you three DOFs, including a, a bond angle, uh, and then something a little bit harder, CH3Cl, which has nine degrees of freedom, both bond lengths and, and, and bond angles. Um, in all of these systems, for the most part, we do grid sampling of, of the bond lengths and, and the different bond angles. Uh, and then I'm just going to show you some, some quick data uh, about the molecular dynamics, uh, and then also geometry optimization here. So the way that we do this uh, is we, we wanna construct a machine learned force field. So we start with different molecular geometries. We feed those geometries uh, in, typically into quantum espresso first. Uh, the quantum espresso will, will then give us not only DFT energies, but, but also wave functions that we can plug in uh, as trial wave functions in, into QMC pack uh, or really any other uh, quantum Monte Carlo utility. Uh, and then once we have the energies from, let's say, QMC pack, uh, we can feed those into a neural network model, which we've been uh, constructing from what we'll call AMP Torch. Uh, so AMP is the atomistic machine learning package. Uh, recently, one of my collaborators has redone it to work with, with PyTorch. Uh, and so this package will do Baylor Paranello neural networks, uh, which will then predict energies and forces that you can use in MD. 
Um, what I'll say is that uh, what I'm showing you today is we're not doing this using active learning. Uh, we have been doing it using active learning much more recently. So, so we really do start with a, a fixed data set uh, that, that's grid sampled. Uh, and then we see how far we can go with that fixed data set. We don't uh, go back and say, oh, we're uncertain here. Why don't we pick up some points, uh, you know, learn, put some new points in our training set to, to repair our uncertainties. Um, all right, uh, so I can show you just a, a few predictions. Uh, so we, we can start with, uh, so, so here's C2. Uh, we can obtain DFT energy predictions and compare them uh, to DFT itself. Uh, so, so DFT is on the, the top here, uh, and we have amp torch DFT with forces, amp torch DFT without forces. Uh, and as you might expect, the energies are learned reasonably well. Uh, so, so these are pretty much on, on top of each other. Uh, but uh, as, as David is, is rightfully suggesting, of course, if you don't have forces, uh, then you're losing some of this information, particularly in regions where there's significant curvature. Uh, so in this, this low bond length region, uh, where there's a really steep curve, uh, you do see that the points, so the, these red points, the amp torch DFT without forces tend to start falling off. Uh, and they also start falling off uh, in, in this longer uh, distance region. Uh, so you do have issues with these curved regions. Um, what I should say is there are nice corrections for this law, uh, short uh, bond distance region. Uh, so you could put in empirical potentials that, that have the right slope and make sure that you fit to those. Uh, and those generally correct uh, this issue here. This is a little bit harder to, to correct just empirically. Um, you can go in and then also do the, the same thing for DMC. Uh, of course, now with DMC, you have error bars, but, but you can learn uh, exactly the curvature for, for these DMC systems, which will, in fact, of course, be, be different than, than the DFT. Yep. Is this a single CO, C2 molecule? Uh, in this case, it's, it's single C2. So it may actually forces an energy source sort of equivalent because you only have one force. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's true. Yes. Yep. Well, I'm surprised that you would get a difference between in this, in this example. But. Right. So, so your surfaces are, are different, and, and therefore, if you take the derivatives, they're, they're going to be different. Right. Uh, so, so these curvatures are a little bit different. Uh, and, and so the forces, in some sense, are, are blowing up the differences that you would see here. Okay, uh, so we can do dynamics with this. Uh, so we can plug this in, uh, we can do dynamics. Um, now, suffice it to say, it doesn't make sense to compare trajectory to trajectory. You know, dynamics never progresses exactly the same way every single time. And so it's better to, to compare things like our average bond distances, uh, get some observable out of these, these kinds of trajectories. Uh, and you, know, you can't directly compare the DFT with the DMC, but you, you can compare the, these kinds of uh, averages with each other to get some sense of what's going on. Uh, and, and so without forces, we can still get things uh, basically right up to the third decimal place. Uh, so, so there are differences, obviously, in the surfaces, in the forces, um, but there's a little bit of averaging once you, you, you do the molecular dynamics. Uh, and so that allows us to, to recoup some of those, those errors here. Yeah, sure. Is your purpose to sample the potential or is your purpose to study the dynamics? Um, so, this is just sample. Yeah, yeah. So, so what we were trying to do uh, is we're trying to uh, obtain some meaningful dynamics. So we're just trying to obtain, what we're trying to say is, can we actually measure reasonable observables from the dynamics uh, that look right? So you, you're, you're right that you, depending upon your temperature, so this is MVE actually, but uh, depending upon your temperature, you're, you're gonna be sampling more of the potential energy surface. And then you might ask, you know, do you have enough points there? So I'm looking at, if you're, if you're interested in the dynamics, look at a dynamical correlation. Uh, uh, sure, sure. And then in that respect, the noise, and I wonder if the Yes, yeah. You circumvent that? Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, it, exactly. So, so we didn't measure correlation functions. I, I appreciate your point 100%. Uh, we were trying to look at other observables to start with, but I agree that the thought that I initially had was maybe we can get rid of some of the noise. If we looked at the observables, it would average away over the course of the, the trajectory. Um, we have not looked at correlation functions, but you could, absolutely. Um, okay, we, we can do similar things for MVT, but, but let me skip to geometry optimization. Uh, so we can use the same forces to try to do geometry optimization. Uh, of course, if we do fully ab initio DFT, 
uh, you know, then that our runtime is much, much longer by, by factors of hundreds. Um, but we do in fact see that we can kind of get over some of the noise that, that we have uh, from, from the learning uh, in, in terms of uh, optimizing things because we, we can reach uh, an optimum in, in two to three iterations. So even though our forces are not perfect, uh, we can in fact optimize to a reasonable structure uh, within you know, less than a percent error uh, if, if we do run optimizations based on these forces. Uh, so, so this is potentially one way of, 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 even though we don't have exact forces, we can do optimizations reasonably well, perhaps at the cost of, of, of some number of iterations, which isn't a huge cost, right? So if we do more iterations, we're still not reaching uh, a factor of a hundred or a few hundred here. All right, maybe I'll show you just a couple more things uh, and, then, and then wrap up. Uh, so one question that people might have is, is what are the effects of statistical error bars on, on this entire process? Uh, so this is a case, this is the case with, with water. Uh, and what we wanted to see is, is just as you increase the, the number of DMC blocks, as you, you would expect, the DMC uncertainty will go down. So that's this purple, uh, we, we see that the uncertainty goes down. Um, but what does that actually do to your training and, and your testing uh, MAE? Uh, and so what we see here is that at some point, you know, things do go down uh, as, as you decrease your statistical uncertainty. Um, but what you do see is that there tends to be a little bit of a flattening out. Uh, and we find that that flattening out has to do with essentially when the, the mean values have converged. Uh, so even though we might have error bars that are still significant, uh, once our means have, have essentially fixed themselves, uh, then we start to flatten out these MAEs, uh, which, which sort of makes sense. So, so one might, might naively want to you know, converge your error bars down to very, very, very small values, but, but it's really the positioning of, of where your averages are that matters most for, for the training. Uh, and so that's what we, we start to see when these curves, particularly the red curve, starts to, to flatten out here. Okay, um, so one last thing uh, I'll, I'll just show to you that, that CH3CL uh, also converges. Here you have to be much more careful about your, your training set, of course. Uh, so if you just did regular grid-based sampling, uh, your training set would, would grow combinatorially with the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, and so we have to be careful about that training. Uh, what we also have to be careful about is, is sampling enough high energy points. So, so what I'm showing here are a number of configurations that, that we're taking, and then we're ordering them according to energy. Uh, and what you see is because of the accuracy of couple cluster, you, you, you get essentially a line, um, but you see that with, with DMC and DFT, uh, there, there's a little bit more blur here uh, because a number of the points, even though they, they have to be higher in energy, don't, don't quite line up that way with, with error bars. Uh, and and uh, you know in DFT the overall accuracy. So uh, we, we found that it's very important to, to get the high energy regions. If we actually leave this out, uh, we, we get very wrong answers. Uh, and if we do that, just as a proof of principle, we can, we can get uh, different bond lengths uh, and bond angles within a, a few percent. Uh, so, so this is, uh, this, we are comparing with, with the original DFT, uh, obviously DMC is different than DFT, but um, we're, we're within a few percent of the answers that, that you would expect. So this is using uh, that grid-based sampling, but there, there are a huge number of degrees of freedom. Uh, and, and what we're currently working on is, is thinking about how do you actually do this in an active learning approach? Uh, in a more active approach, we would say, we start with this set uh, of training points. Uh, and then once we see uncertainties, uh, places where we think our curvature is wrong, we're gonna go in and we're gonna substitute training points uh, that eliminate those uncertainties. The other nice aspect of active learning would be that we can, we can also employ that for forces. So I was kind of suggesting this at the beginning at David's question uh, is, you know, this is, this is expensive. We have to repair things uh, without having any forces, which means we have to do more energies. We have to incorporate more energies into our training set. But you could probably get around some of these issues by actually reaching a happy medium. Uh, where you have energies, you learn from energies, but you supplement with forces in a purposeful manner. Uh, so you don't just do all energies, you don't just do uh, all energies and forces, um, but you actually have a mix of both, uh, which would probably lower the cost most uh, for, for methods like QMC. 
Okay, uh, so what I've shown you here today are, are a couple of examples of just places where, where we think potentially QMC can be accelerated uh, using machine learning methods. Uh, I, I've showed you the case of, of uh, extrapolating to the thermodynamic limits. Uh, I've also shown you the, the, the objective of, of looking at QMC dynamics. Uh, and of course, one has to go to much more complicated systems in order to really see if the, the machine learning works and, and if we can truly surpass uh, current methods that are out there. Um, we also have to make better use of, of, of sampling. I, I would say, you know, in this case, we're, we're not making great use of all the statistical samples that that QMC uh, gives us automatically, but we should be thinking about that more actively in the future. Uh, and then the, the key question for us is really, how do you keep training set sizes manageable? I, I mean, this is the problem with, with, with all of uh, the kinds of ML-based models. Uh, you know, it, it looks easy for a small system, but as you go to many, many, many degrees of freedom, you, you end up with a very large training set, uh, and, and that sort of gets you into trouble at the end. Uh, and so this is one of the key questions that at least we're focusing on right now. You know, how much does active learning give you? How much does, does knowledge of the actual physics give you to, to bring down these training set sizes? is to make something reasonable. All right, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll thank you for your attention. Uh, you know, and I'll, I'll also thank you for, for dealing with the, the talk rustiness. Uh, I'll, I'll thank my group. Uh, this was during the, the dark of the fall of 2021. Hopefully we'll have a brighter <laughs> picture in the future. Uh, and these are my funding sources for, for this kind of work. So thank you again. <laughs>